Thus far, I have outlined merely a positive view of love. Love by a particular subject, for an object, arises out of the qualities of the object that the subject perceives, but is also determined by whether the subject considers those qualities to be good. Two subjects, examining the same object, and recognizing the same qualities, might have different normative evaluations of those qualities, arising from different prior intellectual and emotional syntheses. One's understanding of what is good will determine whether one loves the things, activities, and people one encounters. Hence, the spectrum of what humans love is as wide as the spectrum of human normative evaluations. The remainder of this series shall be devoted to a normative view of love, namely, what qualities of which objects an individual ought to perceive as good and therefore to love. How ought different kinds of love differ depending on the different objects of love? What errors can one make with regard to love and how might they be avoided? The practical rationalist view contains an extensive normative component intended as a guide to everyday action. It not merely describes what love is in general, but also what love ought to be in particular, and how one ought to approach it through one's own behaviors. My view is not just rationalist, it is also individualist in ethics. The rational individualist considers his own life to be the foremost ethical value. Logic, however, precludes the rational individualist from claiming the possibility of sacrificing other people's lives in the furtherance of his own, unless it be in self-defense against direct aggression. Other people are fundamentally like oneself in that they are human and possess every basic human faculty. If I ought to value my own life as foremost, and this imperative is universal for every person from his own vantage point, then there is no consistent way of denying another person's ultimate value without denying one's own. If it is not legitimate for person X to pursue his life as the highest value, then why is it legitimate for me to pursue mine, given that person X and I are fundamentally alike in that we are both human? If I deny person X the right to pursue his life as his highest value, what consistent argument can I present against him denying me my right to pursue my life? Thus, the rational individualist believes that he ought to maximize his own long-term, fully considered self-interest, given the stipulation that logical consistency requires that he not infringe on the natural rights of any other person. There are four primary kinds of love for living creatures depending on the qualities of the object. One of these kinds of love may coincide and overlap with the three others, but also may encompass objects outside the three other kinds of love. This is love for the innocent. The other three kinds of love, love for parents, love for children, and love for a spouse, may not be directed by a single subject at the same individuals, as these kinds of love entail fundamentally different relationships between the subject and the object. Each of the four different kinds of love arise from a recognition of and a desire to advance different kinds of goodness, as summarized in the following diagram. The desire to preserve innocence leads to love for the innocent. The desire to express gratitude leads to love for one's parents. The desire to reward virtue leads to love for one's spouse. And the desire to cultivate competence leads to love for one's children. And you can see the diagram by following the link in the references section accompanying this presentation. So what is love for the innocent? Innocence is today often conflated with inexperience or ignorance of the evils and problems 
present in the world. Yet, while many creatures that are inexperienced and ignorant are also innocent, this is not the defining characteristic of innocence. Rather, innocence is best described as a complete lack of malice toward any living creature, combined with a lack of severe unintended threats toward any human being. It is possible to be both aware of and to have experienced evil without wishing evil upon any living being. Thus, creatures of any age or degree of intelligence and knowledge have the potential for being innocent. All infants and young children of any species are innocent in that they have neither developed any malice toward any living creature, nor the ability to unintentionally harm any human being. While some adult humans may have ill intentions toward other creatures, no baby human has such intentions. While an adult leopard may be dangerous for human beings, even though he intends no malice and is simply acting on his instincts, a baby leopard does not have the ability to seriously harm a human being. Thus, both the baby human and the baby leopard are innocent creatures, whereas the adult human and adult leopard may or may not be. A benevolent adult human or a tame gentle adult leopard can too be innocent. The preservation of innocence is always in one's rational self-interest, because one cannot come to serious harm from an innocent creature. An innocent creature may unknowingly act to produce some degree of inconvenience, such as a cat might cause by scratching a piece of furniture. But this inconvenience is not motivated by the desire to inflict harm, and can be easily averted by restructuring the innocent creature's environment. However, the more prevalent innocence is in the world, the safer the world will be, and the easier it will be to flourish in it. Consequently, it is desirable for one to experience a profound emotional satisfaction upon observing innocent beings and their behaviors, because this satisfaction will render one much more inclined in every immediate instance to preserve innocence wherever one encounters it. An individual acts much more effectively in the furtherance of an object if that object is valued with the emotions as well as the intellect, provided that the emotions reinforce what the intellect resolves to be true, and do not struggle against reason and prudence. Innocent creatures encompass pets, infants of every species, many children whose motivations have not been corrupted by their more vulgar peers, and an unknown but a minority proportion of human adults. It is quite possible that one's own children, spouse, or parents are innocent, in which case they ought to be loved for their innocence in addition to the love which they deserve as good children, spouse, or parents. Some innocent creatures are incapable of averting evil done to them by malicious persons, or harm done to them by inanimate nature. Love for these creatures implies striving to create a benevolent environment for them, such that they do not need to encounter vicissitudes from which they cannot preserve themselves.